right. Welcome, everyone. Um, so welcome to the final week for No Classics for Lent. Um, I'm sure you're aware at this point, all who are watching, but the No Plastics for Lent initiative led by young adults across the church calls us to prayer for creation, to lament the ways that we've been complicit in the degradation of the earth and to action to care for our neighbor in fasting from the things that are hurting our planet. So this year's discussions have been focused on how advocacy can be a tool for creation care and eco-justice. And today's panel I'm really excited about. I am only here in a facilitation manner. Um, but excited to be surrounded by um, brilliant people. And uh, that panel discussion will uh, be with Will Milner. He is the Hunger Advocacy Fellow with the ELCA's Advocacy Office in DC. Autumn Byers, another Hunger Advocacy Fellow with Lutheran Advocacy Ministry, Arizona. And Alex Parker, the Advocacy Coordinator for the ELCA's Advocacy Office in DC. Hello, all of you. Um, today, we're, our topic of discussion is um, civic engagement and the idea of being a creation care voter. Um, so thank you all for joining me. To kick things off, I thought it would be fun to do an icebreaker round. And so my question for each of you is, what is one memory you associate with voting or civic engagement? Whoever feels most called go first. I'll go first. Um, during 2020, I worked at a polling place. Um, it was my first ever paid job. So it was very exciting, very baptism by fire. Um, and in Arizona, we had a really extended early voting period. Um, our primaries are in August. So the whole summer was open for voting because of the pandemic. Um, and I remember one day, a young man, he was maybe 25, came in and he came in with his parents, neither of whom spoke English. And he told me that his parents had both, that they had come from Somalia and his parents had just now finally gotten their citizenship. And this was the first time they were able to vote. And he asked me if, you know, we were able to, like what resources we were able to provide and if he was able to, you know, can I translate for my pa parents? Am I allowed to go into the voting booth with them? He said, yes, please do. Um, and they voted together as a family. And then afterwards, they asked me to take their picture outside of the uh, election place. And I just, I, that has stuck with me um, in the years since as just like a, as someone, you know, born in America who started voting when I was 18. Um, sometimes you don't realize how like special and important voting is and how many people have worked long and hard to be able to do it. And so I always remember them when I go vote, um, that this is a really special and important thing I get to do. And I'm doing it for all of my neighbors and not just myself. Oh, I love that. What a like great reminder. And, and it's so refreshing to see someone excited to vote because we, that's not always the case. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alex, how about you? Yeah, sure. I, I think you know, there's a lot of different moments uh, in my life that I think have shaped my excitement about civic engagement and voting. Um, the one that instantly came to mind was uh, actually what set my background to study in undergrad and through grad school, like uh, the, the the intersection between uh, international relations and, and religion um, and just the, the study of international foreign affairs. Um, and that was when I was in Scotland with my family uh, for the Brexit referendum. And everybody in our town was very, I, I don't know how much we can delve into British politics, um, but <laughs> was very um, pro-Remain. So I went with my family to the voting booth and I thought it was going to be something just outlandishly crazy and different from the American system. But no, they did the same thing. They walked in, they checked in, was handed a slip that just had two boxes on it. Yes, Remain, or, or um, no, Remain, yes, leave, and, and marked the no box. and. For, to, to remain and, and we left and then we woke up the next morning to this huge shock that it was completely different from what polls suggested um the european union's head was going to be spinning for the next seven eight years still is um but then just looking at how those dynamics played out across the uk and who turned up to vote and who didn't and how 
just because of the way that some of the electoral systems are designed that different opinions can win out even in the most crazy circumstances only for that to be reiterated you know and things like uh, the electoral college here just seeing those comparisons in real life so you know i came back to the us and i was like very very eager to study and and use my civic voice here because i didn't want those same things to happen so fighting you know to have our polling places remain on our college campuses or um uh just yeah uh, or, or or voting with my my dad in um the the primaries when i turned 18 um but I, I do want to shout out uh, Will and I's new blog on uh, the importance of your vote, because in there I mentioned probably my favorite voting memory, which is in middle school. I guess I've always been obsessed with civic engagement. I, I At school, we would have maps printed out for us. And then I took one home and colored in all the states red and blue with their electoral college numbers to try and guess what the outcome of the night would be, because I'm just that big of a nerd. So uh, with that mentioned, Will, I'll turn it over to you. I was going to mention your blog, actually, beat me to it, but we have two English two blog. published authors on the call. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're too quick to plug uh, our election <laughs> game stuff, so um, check it out if you haven't already. Um, yeah. <laughs> my God, these are really good stories and it, um, tough acts to follow. Um, as someone who's grown up in the D.C. metro area uh, my whole life, um, I remember or the memory that kind of that came to mind was um, going to DC um, with my family for Obama's inauguration in 2008. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm like eight-ish, seven-ish at the time. Um, so all I remember is bits and pieces, um, getting McDonald's first and foremost, that was, that was important. Um, it being way too early for me to be awake um, is also something I remember. Um, but what really sticks out to me was like the Metro ride up, which is like a weird part to, to hone in on on such like a important day. Um, but just seeing the Metro filled with people and they were all going the same place. Like I, I've yet to see that, um, since even with like sporting events or concerts or whatever, everyone was, you know, wearing chain shirts or wearing with posters and signs. And there was just uh, a tangible excitement on the Metro. And even though it was, you know, the crack of dawn, everyone was excited and hopeful for the future. And it just seeing everyone pour out of the Metro and go to like the Washington, like the, the mall, it was just, it was uh, a definitely a, a memory that's going to stick with me for a, a long time. That's awesome. And, and I mean, you were only eight, so you didn't get to vote, but I, I'm sure for people that were there to see the direct, you know, result of their, their civic engagement had to have been really moving. Um, cool. I'm, I'm jealous that you got to be here. Um, so uh, now I'm going to do a bit of a round robin for questions for each of you, because you each bring great perspective to this conversation. Um, and I, I just want to name beforehand, as we talk about uh, civic engagement, you know, in this conversation, bringing in considerations of creation care to the conversation. You know, none of us can tell someone how to vote, um, but this conversation really is just focused about voting, right? Um, going out and doing it, and then maybe some guiding questions to think about when you go to the polls, but um, each of us are going to discern that differently. So um, just kind of as a disclaimer for this conversation. So I want to start with Will. Um, so I want to know what are some questions that you can ask about your candidates before going to the polls, whether that's something questions that you ask yourself specifically or things people can keep in mind. Yeah, um, great question. I wish I could ask the candidate um, myself, but um, I think specifically um, within this creation care um, voter perspective, I think like the first question you could ask is just, does the candidate believe in climate change? Um, it's 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 crucial to be informed before you head to the poll the polling place, but um, to know where they stand on the issues that are important to you, um, whether that's climate change or whatever, uh, is important. And I think um, there are websites and places um, that you can go because specifically for like climate change, 
or environmental issues like conservation or sustainable practices or environmental justice, those aren't at the forefront of the conversation at these debates, uh, which is unfortunate um, because it's certainly something that's uh, important to people. But you're going to have to do a little bit of your own sussing out. And so one website that I will plug um, is Ballotpedia. Um, that is like a great resource that you should probably use multiple, just throwing that out there. Um, but it's a great place that kind of centralizes all the information on candidates' positions, whether it be on energy and environmental issues or whatever else is important to you. So I, I think it's important to try to find uh, the information, even though it may not be as readily as available as you'd like it to be. Yeah, that's great. And sometimes we get caught up so much in controversial issues and whatnot, whereas, um, especially nowadays, the topic of climate change even in itself is uh, pretty nuanced. You know, a lot of people from both sides want to work on it. And so um, I think, yeah, that's great advice to go in and do some research before um, heading to the polls. Okay, uh, Alex, I'm going to ask you, um, what about the importance, would you say, of voting rights and having fair and safe elections? Yeah, so part of my role here in the DC Advocacy Office is to cover our democracy and voting rights portfolio. Um, and just to kind of frame this within a really broad context, this year alone, we're seeing like a a third of the world's democracies are going to be participating in some form of elections, which means millions and millions and millions and millions of people are going to be casting their votes uh, to decide the future of countries and, and not even countries, but cooperation across the globe. It's, just, it's, it's, it's so much bigger than just ourselves, right? So if we narrow that down to the United States where millions and millions and millions of people are eligible to vote, we have to ask ourselves, well, are they actually able to vote. We know that in the United States, that legislation on climate change that addresses a lot of the issues that we have, or that um, uh, are, are, that that are that voices with communities have about the impact of climate change are incredibly popular. And yet, when we come to elections, those voices are not as representatives. We often find those voices in minority communities, or in rural communities, or in um, underfunded communities that have been uh, gerrymandered or um, just uh, are, are facing even voter suppression. Um, and these voices, through whatever means it is, are not being lifted up and amplified just because uh, the fact is we don't have the equal right to vote as we would like it to be. So part of when you go to vote, uh, kind of what Will was saying is being informed to vote. When you cast your vote, are you thinking about your neighbor's right to vote as well? Are you thinking about the eligible person who's next to you? Have they registered? Have they um, been removed from voter rolls? Have, have the districts moved around? Have um, uh, Are they able to, to, to get to their polling places? Election, there's so many different factors in securing a fair election in the United States. Um, and, and to amplify the ability to have that fair and safe election through your vote, because you can cast that vote for those policies that would make elections fair and representative for everyone uh, eligible to vote. And so by casting that vote with that knowledge in mind, you know, there are positions that are incredibly popular in the United States, like climate change uh, legislation that can receive the support, the popular support that, that they, they do have in the United States. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that because I, especially at the federal level, you know, it's, uh, there's, it's just a, it's a really hard conundrum, um, especially with the way that our system is just set up in general, but being able to make sure that people have that right to vote is, is crucial to the foundation of our democracy and to the issues that matter to the people. Yeah. You know, while you were talking, you just really solidified there's, injustice everywhere, right? But environmental injustices are really prevalent and that's something we're really working on um, policy-wise. But without, you know, these underserved communities that are left behind constantly are also left behind when it comes to voting too. You know, it's only exacerbating injustice. Um, so thank you for bringing that to the conversation, Alex. Um, okay, Autumn, 
uh, as our state representative of the group, um, I'd love to ask you about um, the importance of down ballot considerations and these more local and state level official races. Um, please tell, tell us more. <laughs> Yeah, so I, this is one of the first things I brought up when we were talking about what we wanted to discuss today. Um, I am a huge, huge believer in the importance of down ballot issues, right? So um, especially in election years like this one, it can feel so pressing um, that we elect the right president and that our federal situation goes the way we want it to. Um, but those are not the only things that determine environmental policy. Um, there's, you know, there obviously is quite a bit of work that happens at the federal level, but so much of the in and out day-to-day -day parts of how creation care happens is on our state and local levels. So for example, the people deciding how water is used in your state or pollution levels, contamination levels, uh, land use, all of those things that maybe don't carry the label of climate change with them, but are still very much about the earth and how we're treating it and whether or not we're feeding into climate change. Those are policies that are set by your state legislature uh, and, and counties and even municipalities do a lot with like water quality and things like that. Um, and there is, in years like this, there there can be a lot of feeling that like, well, the presidential race is the one that matters. And if that doesn't go my way, then the whole issue of climate change is lost. And there's even some like actual messaging telling us that sometimes um, when that's just not true. Uh, something I find so endlessly fascinating about ecological issues and environmental policy is it really underlines how connected our world is. I remember, you know, learning about environmental science in high school and just marveling about how interconnected our our world is. You know, hunger is influenced by agriculture, which has to do with water use, which has to do with all sorts of economic policy and geography and like the entire way we live our lives is is every issue is about another thing. And I think that's really important when we talk about, you know, socioeconomic factors and racial factors that, you know, certain communities are underprivileged for a reason. Uh, and you see, especially when you get into down ballot stuff, uh, much more bipartisanship and a lot of people working on environmental issues, even if they don't always get labeled as environmental issues because water use, which is huge in Arizona, uh, affects our economy. And that's something everybody's gonna care about. Um, and we all know that responsible stewardship usually ends up going better for everybody in the long term. And so I encourage everybody to also really get to know the people running on your state and local level because those are the places you can enact change. Your single singular voice has uh, you know, a lot more amplification on a smaller level. These are people you can get to know. You can go down to your city hall or your state legislature much easier than most of us can get to DC. Um, and those are the places where you can really start influencing policy by voting for these candidates, by voting for propositions um, that, that really put into action the ways that we as a community can be caring for our creation. I love your excitement around this because it's so necessary. Yeah, um, I, I've always, I mean, I work for the federal office, so I've always been focused more on the U.S. or international pieces, but I remember learning about C40 cities. It's it's a climate movement, and it's a network of mayors of major cities across the world that agreed that they were going to implement climate policies, whether their states or countries could figure it out, they were going to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, looking into it, the C40 cities alone account for one fourth of the global GDP of the world. And they were able to get these mayors to agree because it's a lot easier to get agreement when you're in a city of like-minded people, people don't pay as much attention to local elections. Like it was, when I learned about it, I was like, oh my gosh, this could really flip a lot of things on the head. So, um, and yeah. it makes sense. It makes sense, yeah. right? Because the federal government cannot, be making policy on the minute level about how much, you know, 
what your rebate is for converting your yard to a more water-friendly landscape here in Arizona, right? But my city and my state can because they are made up of this community. And so like while federal policy is so important, the like actual concrete day-to-day -day things that can help us really be proactive about the world we live in can be made on that smaller level. 100%. And it's going to have to be. I mean, these the the things that are really making that incremental change is what's going to be happening at the local level. And so, um, yeah, we really make a lot of change if we focus more on the on the down ballot. Not that the federal point is not important, right, Alex? <laughs> I, just, I was going to jump in because I actually think that there is a really strong connection uh, between the local and state government to a lot of federal policy that's going on. And I'm going to combine it with what Will said about having that informed vote and also what Autumn said about um, realizing that sometimes climate change legislation isn't labeled as climate change legislation. We have things like the Farm Bill, which is this massive million dollar giant package that could, that has a conservation part in it that could be under threat, right? But that conservation money can go towards that local farmer and help them produce that agriculture and feed cities and help them with their soil erosion or soil degradation or crop subsidies, crop insurance, all those things that can be impacted by climate change. So there is a big connection to that. You need the support from the federal, but you really have to think about the people on the local level to get that support, for, to, to get that support too. So there's just such a strong connection there that I don't want to go uh, askew because yeah. I think you're right, Autumn. I think I, I like, you are more impacted by what happens in your municipality. Like they are the ones who come pick up your garbage. They are the ones who keep your streets clean. They are the ones who who run your white and your power. Like, but there there is a consideration that you, sometimes how um, some of those resources that the federal government can to, can give to those who are on the front lines of that climate change, um, uh, uh, that that those climate change concerns. Definitely, definitely. And the, the federal government really sets that standard across, that know, too. across the whole country, which is nice. And the, the states can go more specific or more stringent. Right. Yeah. I love how we have we have like kind of a debate going on. Um, Will, did you do you have a, a camp that you're choosing to, to sit in? <laughs> um, I'm I'm you know what? I'm going to betray the federal advocacy office and I'm going to go with the states. Whoa. <laughs> oh my I gosh. don't think we're debating I think we're agreeing with each other because I think, I, I think we're agreeing because you know the federal policy is so important because it sets priority and it shows us um you know are we going to be pushing for climate change to matter for the next four years or not and so it absolutely is important and I don't definitely don't want to imply otherwise um I just think so many people especially people my age I think tend to think about when we think about climate change we think about okay what is congress doing and what does the president believe in climate change or not? And those are absolutely important, important things. Um, and I think sometimes we can forget that acts of conservation and stewardship are really happening at like incremental level as well. And so, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to plug our blog again, just the title though, that there's just kind of what like Autumn's saying, everyone tends to think that the it's the most important election of our lifetime who's elected president, right? Because they set that administration and policies, but there's so much more to your vote than you think. Uh, and 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 just because of how much it can influence your lives down to the most minute detail that you never would have thought of. Um, and climate change is, I think, the prime example of that. Yeah, definitely. So I guess as we're all agreeing that we agree and, and everything is complimentary, um, Will, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about the importance of thy neighbor and all creation and, and what that means to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I wish you guys could see my notes because um, you've fully hit all of the points already um, that I was going to make. So this will be a short answer. Um, but I think, you know, I, I didn't grow up um, Lutheran, um, but I, I can I feel like I'm an adopted Lutheran. Um, but there's certainly similarities between AME, which is the faith I grew up with, um, and Lutheranism. And I feel like, um, many faiths, um, which I don't per have personal knowledge of, but I, I think that there is a, a universal call to uphold, like, uh, to uphold principles of justice, kindness, and stewardship and caring for one another 
and the environment that kind of all um, ties into that, like the interconnectedness that um, we've talked about. The concept of thy neighbor extends beyond just your immediate social circle. It can be the birds and the bees and the trees. So I think making sure that when you go to the polling place, um, that you make sure that your vote uh, upholds the principle of loving thy neighbor and advocates for justice and equity for all individuals, I think is important. Because that is something that is so directly expressible in our vote, right? Is when we vote for candidates, who who are they representing? Who do they, because they will tell you who they are seeking to represent and what parts of our population they want to speak for and uplift and which ones maybe they don't. Um, and I think so often we can go into the voting booth with our own self-interest and it can be very easy to leave out our neighbor. Um, I have heard people say, well, I don't really care about that issue or I don't care that this politician doesn't bring up that issue. I know it matters for other people, but like that's just not something that's really relevant to my life. And that always makes me so sad to hear because we are called to live together as neighbors and to care for each other. And voting is such an important way, especially those of us who are able to access the voting booth more easily than others, um, where we can show up and say, no, I'm, I'm not just here to represent myself. I'm here to represent the rest of my community that I love and care about. And I can express that by voting for politicians who recognize dignity for all people and for politicians who espouse policies that are going to help our vulnerable neighbors, right? I think that's such an important one is it's a lot harder for someone experiencing homelessness to go vote than it is for me. And I want to make sure someone is making sure that those interests are represented in the ballot box. And so I think you're very, very right about that, Will. That, that's a great point. Um, that even if you may or not may not feel uh, very motivated to go vote, um, that you're not just voting for yourself, you're voting for your neighbors. So I think, thank you. Um, that was helpful. That's like so beautiful. And I think that is something that um, we as, you know, people of faith, I think that's what God calls us to do, right? Is that we're not, you know, it is your civic duty, but that civic duty is not just about yourself and, you know, what candidate's going to make you more money. Um, so if we can, if that's the call that we can make from this call, I think we would be well off to, to ask people to think about thy neighbor and all of creation. Um, I make the joke in our office with other policy directors that I'm the easiest date because I think that my policy portfolio of you know climate climate and environment um, intersects with any other issue. And so you know this isn't the claim that you should only think about climate change when you go in to vote, but I do think that there is a way that considering creation care when you vote will also encompass a lot of other issues. Um, and really open that door into thinking, you know, how can you vote not just for yourself, but for your neighbors? Can okay. I say Alex? one thing before yeah. we move on? Because I, I feel like if I don't mention um, a theological point in this, my seminary professors might cringe somewhere. <laughs> um, but there is a there is just a, a major theologian that we talk about here in the D.C. office sometimes who goes by the name of Jurgen Moltmann. Uh, and he just has this beautiful line in a book of his called, I think it's called Spirit and Creation, but, and it kind of goes to the point that Will was talking about is it's the importance of thy neighbor, but also all of creation. And Jurgen Moltmann says that, you know, because of our role as humans, as God's creation of humans and being created in God's image, we have the responsibility to stand before God as a representation of all creation, not just your neighbor, but as Will said, the bees and the trees and everything in between. Um, so, you know, you're, you're you're voting for that neighbor, but you're also voting for the rest of creation as well. Oh. And I think that's that's so truly rooted in our faith, because in in Genesis, when when the first humans are told to steward the earth, that doesn't mean just cultivate it and dominate it. It means to walk with, to be a part of. Um, and it's our responsibility to be ingrained in it. Um, and that's truth through the whole bible to cultivate and keep <laughs> awesome okay we're go we're, we're running a little long um but i that's not a bad thing we have a lot of expertise in the room so i'm going to ask the last question to each of you and we're going to end on a positive note alex 
<laughs> um, so try to keep it brief, but I'm not going to turn it off on you. So whatever. Um, I'm asking each of you to tell me how do you continue to vote even though it may seem pointless? I think I, as well as all of us, have come across people who feel very defeated or apathetic about elections. It can be scary. Um, if you, you or your team loses, you can feel like the system's working against you. So how do you feel um, that voting, there is a point to voting and how, how you can continue to vote? Um, I will pass it to Alex first. Because it, it is me, I can be the pessimist. Um, <laughs> Christine, it, it's like polar opposites. We've had this conversation before where she is the optimist in this arena and I can be quite the the, the pessimist sometimes. But I, I do think that what gets me excited about civic engagement and voting is knowing that when I wake up in the morning, I can take action that goes just beyond myself. Even if I feel like my individual vo like voice and vote can doesn't contribute to something larger, it does. Uh, inevitably, I am voting for something that doesn't just impact me, uh, no matter how I'm feeling, if I'm feeling more optimistic or pessimistic that day, but just knowing that kind of like our, what our blog title said, there's more to your vote than you think. And that's, it's a, and I'll leave it at that. Oh, I love that. I think this is a point of optimism for you, Alex, when it comes <laughs> to elections. I think, I think you got it. Um, how about Will? Yeah. Um, and it's funny, like yesterday I was, um, cause it was Super Tuesday, um, depending on when we release this uh, for context, I was texting my friends um, to go vote. I was just saying, go out, it's Super Tuesday, um, giving them a little background because uh, they weren't as familiar with it. Um, and one of my friends who's um, Palestinian was like, why, why should I go vote? Like, vote for who? Um, and I said, so your voice is heard, I think. Um, we can learn a lot from what happened in Michigan um, with the uncommitted vote, which is that, you know, using your voice will always uh, bring momentum or build momentum. You have no idea uh, what the future will hold. And, you know, especially in this job, advocating for legislation um, that may have no chance of passing still lets lawmakers know that there are people out there in the world that care about that issue. And it may not lead to a direct outcome that you were hoping for, but you may have been, uh, to be cheesy, planting the seeds uh, for future growth. Um, and I also think it's, it's worthwhile to mention many individuals throughout history fought and sacrificed to secure your right to vote. Um, so continuing to honor their legacy by voting, by trying to amplify your friends and your neighbors' uh, voices is always important for um, collective change. I'll leave it at that. Mm, thanks, thanks for that and bringing in rel really relevant examples too. Okay, Autumn, how do you, how do you continue voting? This is one of my favorite questions. Um, and I think Will makes, you, you've brought up some, some really, really important ideas because voting is not a zero sum game. Um, I live in a competitive, in a non-competitive district um, that never, never, ever goes the direction that I'm voting for. And yet I show up and I vote and I, I, you know, stay an active constituent in that district because I want to show that there are people in this district who have a different set of pri priorities. And I, uh, I want things in my state to be going different and better. And I am really, really against the idea of making um, it easy to make bad decisions for our, like to let our politicians do it easily. Um, and I think while it it is absolutely important who wins an election, um, that does not mean that it is the only thing that matters on the ballot. Um, because as Will said, if you show up and you can vote on propositions and ballot measures and candidates and they lose, 
it sends a very different message if something you support loses by a small margin or if it loses by a really big margin. Um, because at the end of the day, politicians care about public opinion, whether they care for altruistic reasons or selfish reasons, they all care. And so showing up and voicing your opinion, whether or not it goes the way you want, uh, is a witness, right? It's one of the ways we can show up for each other and, and show up as someone who cares about these things. And it continues to put pressure on the systems to, to not turn away from complex issues. Um, and it's also a way we can show up and say, hey, I care about my neighbors. Um, there are people that this matters to you, that this matters to, and we can't just, we're not just gonna turn away from it, even if I'm not successful this time. Um, and over a long period of time, that absolutely can add up and make a difference. Um, and also you never know when it might go differently this time. You. Your proposition might have lost for the last four years and this year it might pass or who knows. So um, I think hope is something that is very tenacious and is very hard to keep that way. Um, but if we can all be stubborn about our hope for a better future um, and the importance of showing up and expressing this opinion, whether or not it goes successfully, um, that is absolutely still of value. Oh my gosh. That was, I feel like I want to go out and vote again and again and again. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming and talking. This was such a empowering group of young people that are out here doing the work, um, both professionally and personally. Um, so I hope that this can be an example and an igniter for those watching um, to, to feel like your vote matters and to, to feel like this is important and this is not daunting and this is not pointless and scary. Um, we can take some positives away no matter what the official turnout is. So, um, and I love Will's example, text your friends on voting day. We should all normalize that and bring them to the polls with you. Find two friends that haven't voted before. Um, yeah, okay, well, thank you all for attending and um, just know that these are great resources within the ELCA. So, all right. Bye, everyone.